right, great. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome to the final event in the MOVA webinar series. Today, we'll be discussing gender sensitive public works programs, economic inclusion, and the provision of social services. Today will again be a two part event. And we're uh, delighted to be joined by a wonderful panel of experts, practitioners, and government representatives for this first hour before taking a closer look at MUVA's experience with the innovative and highly successful Assistenches project. So before I go any further, I would like to highlight that today will be a multilingual event with speakers uh, speaking in both English and Portuguese. We are very lucky to be joined by Sandra Tamel, who will be providing simultaneous interpretation into both languages for us today. To listen to her interpretation, please go to your controls at the bottom of your screen and select the globe icon, as you can see on the screen in front of you. From there, you can choose either English or Portuguese, depending on your preferred language. If you're joining us from a phone, you will need to click on the options menu, represented by the three dots on your screen. From there, click on interpretation, select your language, and then accept that choice by clicking done. We also have English language closed captioning available today. So if you would like to access the captions, please select either subtitles or CC at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions or problems with any of these uh, technical features, please write a message in the chat and our technical team will be happy to assist you. So I'd now like to provide some context for our webinar series by saying just a few words about MUVA. MUVA was launched in 2015 as a flagship women's economic empowerment program in Mozambique, financed by the Department for International Development, now called the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and implemented by OPM, or Oxford Policy Management. Over its seven years, MUVA has piloted 19 different projects including the Innovative Assistentias Project, which introduced the concept of classroom assistance to the Mozambican education system in partnership with the National Public Works Program and the Instituto Nacional de Acción Social, or INES. Although OPM's MUVA program is now winding down, a national Mozambican NGO, also called MUVA, was established in 2020 and continues the work begun under the MUVA program, thanks to the support of multiple donors. So this webinar series has been a chance for us to celebrate the rich learnings coming from MUVA, and today is no exception. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Jana Bischler, who will be facilitating today's discussion. Yana is a senior social protection consultant with OPM and also works as a mal advisor to MUVA. Yana, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Magali, for this really helpful introduction. Uh, and also welcome everyone from my side. It's a real pleasure for me to be facilitating the webinar today. Um, especially because we have such a great uh, panel of speakers um, to share their experiences. Um, so as Magali said, this is the last of um, seven webinars actually that MUVA has been organizing in the past two months. And the session today is dedicated to discussing, discussing the intersection between social protection and more specifically public works programs and women's economic empowerment. Um, so I will first invite um, Anthony Hodges to set the scene for us today by providing a bit of um, and concept and conceptual overview um, about what we call the triple win through soft public works. Um, Tony has been an uh, associate consultant with OPM for a long time and, and has also been supporting the global social protection space for over 30 years or so, I think. Um, and he's currently also working with us on MUVA to um, help identify additional models for such skills enhancing and gender sensitive public works models. 
Um, after Tony's quick introduction, we'll hear from Carlotta Tomosene from INASH uh, at the Ministry for Gender, um, Children and Social Action in Mozambique, and um, uh, Justin Gatsinzi from uh, who's the social protection programs uh, manager at Rwanda's local administrative entities development agency. And both Carlotta and Justin will be sharing examples of government implemented um, gender sensitive uh, public works programs um, that are also promoting economic inclusion. Um, and finally, we'll have Rebecca Holmes uh, kick off our discussion by providing um, a global perspective on the learnings around gender sensitive social protection, which is her area of expertise that she's been working in for many, many years. So um, before we start, I just wanted to say that um, please make use of the chat box. Uh, so if you have any questions to any of the panelists, just pop them in there and I will make sure to um, get back to them when we launch into the discussion in the second half of this first hour of the webinar. So without further ado, uh, Tony, I'm passing over the word to you uh, to kick us off with a brief uh, introduction to what we call the triple win through soft public works. Thank you very much, uh, Jana. And um, I think somebody will be taking us through the slides. Um, great, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, I'm gonna speak to this, uh, this overall topic um, of, uh, is it possible to get a triple win at scale uh, using public works to promote uh, the economic inclusion um, particularly of, of women, young women, um, and to do this, in fact, through enhancing the delivery of social services. So let's move to the, to the first uh, real slide. Next slide. Um, I think the, a good place to start um, on this is, is really just to, to look at the strengths and weaknesses of, of public works in, in, a, in a general way. I mean, on the strength side, I think one can say that uh, public works, uh, they perform a basic social protection function, um, providing poor households with temporary sources of additional income. I mean, in that sense, they really perform more or less the same role as cash transfers do. Um, it's perhaps noteworthy that in uh, rural areas in developing countries, they're often used to provide income specifically during the lean period um, um, before harvest when uh, households have very little income and, and there are risks of food insecurity and, and malnutrition. Um, and in that sense, they, they sometimes perform a, a function of smoothing incomes in, in the lean season in, in rural areas. And then of course, you know, insofar as these public works are focused on um, developing or rehabilitating infrastructure, uh, they do contribute um, to the creation of, of community assets. Um, however, there, there really are clearly some, some quite serious weaknesses in public works in, in many, many countries. For, for one thing, they, they quite rarely enhance skills. Most of the time, people who are put to work on public works do simple manual labor and don't really have any increase in their, in their, in their skills and, and technical capacity that would enhance their employment prospects uh, in the future. And a bit by the same token, it's really quite difficult for these public works uh, programs to succeed in achieving the, the graduation of their beneficiaries. That's to say, to put their beneficiaries on a path where they are able eventually to come out of the program um, in a stronger position to um, um, have a, you know, a, a level of income and, uh, and uh, well-being uh, without the need for continued social uh, protection. There is also a risk in some cases that, um, that I would still, still stay on the same slide, that um, uh, public works can reinforce gender inequality by overburdening women within a household gender uh, division of labor. I mean, there's even a risk, I think, that in some cases, um, the household may send the women to do the public works um, on top of their, uh, you know, their, their normal, their normal um, 
um, uh, you know, labor within, within the household. Um, on the other hand, there is also a risk that um, if things like childcare are not available for participating in public works, that um, this may expose children to um, very unfortunate circumstances, either being taken to, to work sites or being left without proper care at, at home, or, or, the, or, or the, this sort of double burden of women will lead to a situation where women are not able to participate in the public works. So this, this issue of, um, of this gender aspect or dimension of public works is a, is a major concern. Um, there is also some, uh, a lot of evidence, I think, that uh, many of the public works that provide very low wages and um, are not really interesting from the point of view of skills enhancement or improving um, uh, job prospects longer term have little appeal to youth, particularly in the, in the urban areas. And finally, there is a problem that often the quality of the public works themselves is, is, is rather, rather poor. Okay, next slide. Next slide. So what we're looking at here in this uh, webinar really is, are there some opportunities um, um, to, to resolve some of these deficiencies in, in public works? by um, focusing public works on the delivery of essential so social services. The idea here is that it would be possible to address some of these weaknesses and, and also to address another problem, which is of course that the social services in many developing countries are, are um, inadequate and of poor quality. So these are four, four possible ways in which um, social sector um, focused public works might be able to be a way forward. One is that they could help to strengthen the delivery of social services. A second is that they could perhaps make public works more gender responsive um, by making it easier for women to participate and without overburdening them within the household division of labor. In addition, they could perhaps provide entry-level work experience for youth, including young women with varying levels of education, and thereby also contribute to the economic inclusion of youth and women. So let's move on to the next slide. Next slide. So what we want to look at is the possibility of achieving this triple win, where there would be public works, uh, that would strengthen the social service services and at the same time provide opportunities for skills development, uh, inclusion and empowerment of, of young people and, and women. Um, as in a Venn diagram, we want really that bit in the middle where all of these things, uh, these three things overlap. Next slide. Next slide. The examples, um, uh, presented in this webinar address this, um, this, uh, this set of opportunities. The first um, um, is the Mozambique um, uh, assistant um, um, uh, dimension of the, of the PASHP. The PASHP is the main public works program in Mozambique and the assistant um, uh, project is within, within the PASHP as one of the, the types of public works that is uh, offered. Basically, the, the key feature of this is that uh, it employs youth with a minimum uh, educational level of the 10th class, it hires them as assistants um, to work alongside teachers in overcrowded primary schools, um, and they receive coaching and mentoring while, while before and while they're doing this. The potential... Sorry, with... Tony. Sorry, yeah. just to say that you have about a minute left. <laughs> okay, I will try. Okay, the wins um, are that... This creates an, oppor uh, an opportunity for improved learning by pupils because the classrooms are very overcrowded. It provides interesting work experience for youth who are graduating with secondary education um, and their skills and self-confidence are developed through coaching and classroom experience. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, which we will be hearing about as well, the expanded public works program provides opportunities uh, for women to work in home-based early childhood development, and they also receive training and mentoring. 
And the wins here are that, you know, there's the provision of childcare for moderately labor constrained households so that the children are better looked after. It makes it easier for the women, especially from female headed households to participate in public works. And it provides also lighter work opportunities than in the classic public works. Next and last slide. Next slide. Yeah, and just last, finally, I just wanna raise one other example, which won't be presented in this um, uh, webinar, but which I think it's interesting to look at because it is an example of doing this kind of thing really at a large scale. Whereas the examples we'll be hearing from in Mozambique and Rwanda are still relatively small and limited to quite specific areas of, uh, of social sector public works. In the case of South Africa's expanded public works program or the EPW, there are four large categories of public works covering infrastructure, environment and culture, the social sectors, and also non-state actors, community groups and NGOs. It's notable that the social sectors part of the program provides 43% of the EPW's person years of work. Um, you can see there um, some of the different types of social sector public works. They're in a wide range of, of different areas, including, for example, the response uh, to, to COVID. The institutional framework, I think, is interesting here because this program is at scale because it's based on agreements with a wide range of public sector institutions at central, provincial, and municipal levels. That's to say it's not just the central government, but the provincial governments and the municipalities in South Africa that provide the opportunities and implement this program in practice, as well as large numbers of different NGOs and community organizations. And this makes it possible to implement this kind of social sector uh, public works uh, really at scale. And you can see that in the, the chart there that in the third phase of 2014 to 2019, uh, they created 4.5 million work opportunities in South Africa through this program. So this is an example of many institutions coming together to deliver you know, something like this um, on a really large, uh, large scale. Um, with that, I will stop. Um, I'm sorry if I went slightly over, because now we will hear in detail about Rwanda and Mozambique. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tony. This was a super helpful um, introduction. Um, so yes, um, without much more comment, I'll pass over to Carlota to tell us um, more about the assistantes program and how it fits with the fits in as a component with the Mozambican Public Works program. Um, Carlota, puede comenzar con su presentación, por favor. Obrigada. Boa tarde a todos. Um... Dizer de que, em relação a Moçambique, uh, peço para passar mesmo para o... Não, não, o anterior. O slide anterior, se faz favor. Ok. Sim, para dizer que para Moçambique nós temos uma estratégia que define quatro programas. E desses, progr desses programas define também o grupo-alvo do, dos nossos beneficiários, aquilo que nós deveríamos assistir. E como destaque, temos lá a rapariga. Então, essa é a prioridade que foi também atualizada através da Lei de Proteção Social em Moçambique. Os quatro programas temos subsídio social básico, que é virado para pessoas incapacitadas para o trabalho, através de transferências eh, monetárias. Temos também aquilo que são serviços sociais de ação social, eh, viradas para todas as famílias em situações de risco. Temos também o programa Apoio Social Direto, que está direcionado para questões pontuais, para as pessoas que têm, sofrem choques, e temos o nosso programa Apoio Social Produtivo, que está vocacionado para pessoas com capacidade para o trabalho. Próximo. Uh, em relação ao PASP, que é o nosso objetivo aqui, do nosso encontro, uh, ele apresenta-se com duas uh, dimensões, que é os trabalhos públicos uh, inclusivos, mas também acompanhado de programas de, de apoio ao desenvolvimento e iniciativas de geração de rendimento. 
E estas duas componentes, eles devem trabalhar em consonância com aquilo que nós chamamos de salvaguardas ambientais e sociais, visto que os nossos programas não podem provocar danos ao meio ambiente, mas também prevenir aquilo que são os problemas sociais que podem advir uh, desse programa dentro da própria comunidade. Ou, por outras palavras, não é para destabilizar a comunidade, mas sim é para promover. Ah. Ah. Obrigada, mas a seguir. Sim, em relação à evolução, nós iniciamos o nosso PASP em 2012, não é? Com o apoio do Banco Mundial e fomos evoluindo até então. Em 2019, nós iniciamos um, a segunda componente, que é o apoio à iniciativa de, uh, de geração de rendimento. Estas iniciativas nós implementamos em duas vertentes, que era virada para a agricultura e a outra virada para os assistentes de turma. A agricultura nós implementamos num distrito aqui, virada para mulheres, mas de uma certa idade, acima de, 50, de 40 anos de idade, e que estão a desenvolver a agricultura de Moamba, num total de 24. E a nível da cidade de Maputo, nós uh, implementamos uma iniciativa em parceria com o MUFA. A ideia inicial é do MUFA e nós uh, acolhemos a ideia e achamos que era uma iniciativa que nós estávamos à procura para incorporar ou para adicionar o grupo de jovens que muitas das vezes no âmbito dos trabalhos públicos esses jovens eram excluídos. Eram excluídos por várias razões. Primeiro, porque as atividades dos trabalhos públicos não eram atrativos para o grupo de jovens, uh, mas, por outro lado, é, o, 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 nível, o nível desses grupos jovens também não, não, não se sentiam uh, acomodados uh, para fazer parte dessa iniciativa. Então, o governo achou por bem adotar essa iniciativa para poder capitalizar o grupo de jovens que tinham uma, um certo nível de escolaridade, mas também que estavam numa situação de vulnerabilidade e desemprego. Então, com aquilo que era a tendência do MUVO, era só para meninas, mas como governo abraçamos a ideia para todo o grupo jovem. Felizmente, os nossos programas, a maior parte são mesmo raparigas. Próximo slide. Quando o governo desenhou o PASP, e particularmente para a segunda componente, uh, o ideal seria este o pacote que deveria uh, uh, oferecer aos nossos beneficiários. Uh, fazer as capacitações, fazer as transferências de ativos, uh, fazer, monitorar, uh, dar uh, educação financeira, ajudar os nossos beneficiários na facilitação de ligações de mercados, e as transferências monetárias mensais. Este é o pacote ideal, mas até então nós ainda não conseguimos implementar na sua totalidade. Por favor. A seguir. Ah, ok. Ok. E, na iniciativa do MUVA, nós é, fizemos essa, é, é, essa iniciativa e tivemos uma capacitação por favor, ainda não. Peço para o slide me. Sim. Uh, tivemos uma capacitação desses beneficiários que foi promovido pelo Instituto de Formação de Professores e essas mesmas uh, jovens foram integrados em cinco escolas aqui na, a nível da cidade de Maputo, que envolveram 99 uh, jovens. Esses jovens, durante o, o, a implementação do programa, eles foram foram submetidos àquilo que era mentorias. A mentoria é uma ferramenta de desenvolvimento pessoal com o objetivo de promover uh, a, a, a evolução da, das capacidades intrapessoais da própria, desse grupo-alvo. E como resultado dessa, dessa, desse, de, dessa intervenção, nós... Uh, constatamos do, do nosso relatório uma contribuição positiva ou, ou naquilo que são os investimentos das despesas da família, através do subsídio que nós damos. Uh, tivemos também uh, todos os participantes 
não é? Tiveram uma a cobertura daquilo que são as suas próprias despesas do agregado familiar, eles contribuíram bastante sobre esse, esse, esse elemento. Tivemos também uma elevada experiência profissional, eles se sentiram uh, capazes de concorrer para qualquer emprego ou estar em frente de, de, de qualquer... enfrentar os desafios de procurar emprego. Então, esses jovens ficaram capacitados para poder buscar uh, novas oportunidades em termos de emprego para prover o seu sustento. Uh, tivemos também uma boa parte de, dessas, desse, desse grupo de jovens que voltaram à escola. Uh, nós dizíamos que as, os nossos beneficiários são pessoas com, em situação de pobreza e vulnerabilidade e que muitas das vezes, por circunstâncias da vida, eles desistiram de frequentar a escola ou desistiram de sonhar. Então, com essa iniciativa, houve um, um, um acordar, não é? um despertar desses jovens para o futuro. Então, eles pensaram em voltar para a escola. Isso foi bastante positivo para nós. Uh, tivemos também um grupo que começou... A, teve coragem de enfrentar os desafios, de buscar novas oportunidades em termos de emprego. Tivemos também aqueles que não conseguiram, infelizmente até agora, não conseguiram uh, engrenar para buscar algumas oportunidades. Sobre estes que não vão, que não tiveram nenhuma uh, possibilidade, é neste que o governo uh, ainda vai trabalhar com eles no sentido de trabalhar, integrá-los numa formação profissionalizante e talvez disponibilizar um kit para poder promover aquilo que são as suas habilidades e fazer alguma atividade de geração de rendimento. Por favor. Sorry, um, Carlota, só para dizer que tem mais um minuto. Está certo. Tivemos também um, um maior impacto da organização nas salas de aulas. Uh, as crianças estiveram mais concentradas para receber as aulas. Uh, tivemos também aquilo que podemos dizer que os professores houve uma diminuição de peso no, no, no professor. Em vez de estar só a, a, a fazer calar as crianças ou pedir às crianças na concentração, eles tiveram mais tempo para dar a, a matéria da escola. Uh, tivemos mais um envolvimento positivo na correção de, de, daquilo que são os trabalhos de casa. As crianças ficaram, ficaram mais acometidas em, em relação à resolução das, dos trabalhos de casa. Desculpa, mais. Uh, como perspectivas, o governo pretende ter um acordo entre o Ministério de Gênero, Criança e Ação Social e o Ministério da Educação para podermos ter essa abertura de termos mais assistentes de turma a nível, uh, de, de, de todas, uh, a nível nacional. Os programas são nacionais, então a ideia é expandir. Também pensamos bastante, porque nós temos uma fraqueza como instituição na parte das mentorias. A experiência mandou dizer que precisamos de buscar iniciativas do MUVA para poder apoiar o governo no sentido de continuar a dar mentorias, porque achamos que esse foi um, 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 um elemento, um fator preponderante na mudança do comportamento uh, dos próprios beneficiários. Uh, precisamos de formar, nós temos mais de 100 mil beneficiários que estavam nos trabalhos públicos, que nós precisamos de tirar para poderem desenvolver as suas próprias atividades no âmbito deste, deste programa. A seguir, se faz favor. É tudo. E muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Carlota, foi, foi muito interessante. Um, thank you very much. Um, This was uh, really great to see as an example that I think addressed a lot of the uh, issues that um, that uh, Tony also raised earlier. Um, we're now, I'd now like to invite Justin Gatsinzi from Rwanda uh, to present another example of how public works programs can be made uh, more gender sensitive while at the same time providing uh, essential social services. Um, Justin, over to you, please. Yes, all. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jana, and uh, I'm happy to be associated with this uh, webinar. And uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah, okay, as I uh, already introduced, I'm um, Justin, the Division Manager for Social Protection Programs 
at uh, LODA. And uh, the presentation I'm going to make is around the VUP, the Vision Manager Program, which is Rwanda's flagship safety net program covering 1.3 million people in Rwanda. It's managed by LODA with the Ministry of Local Government as a line ministry and implemented by local governments, 30 districts with some other sub-district structures. And uh, I'm privileged to have been on board since the inception of the VUP in 2007, then during its launch in 2009, and I have been engaged in, in its direct oversight since 2009. Uh, in this presentation, whose theme uh, is pre or fault, uh, we will focus on public works with the emphasis on expanded public works, which was specifically designed to address inclusion uh, in the lens of socioeconomic aspects with the gender and the child sensitivity being central uh, to the delivery of social services within the VUP. Next slide. Um, so this is where the deal lies. Uh, when we look at the VUP in its original design uh, and launched in 2008, uh, in its simplicity, it was designed to smoothen income of consumption of the extreme poor. And no wonder um, the only simple task it had to do was to go to the extremely poor households, do a bit of sifting. If a household had labor capacity, it would be channeled to public, public works. And if there was no labor capacity in that household, this household would be channeled to direct support components. And both beneficiaries of public works and direct support would access sensitization uh, campaigns. And uh, uh, whoever had the ability to partake in income generation, generating activities, would access the financial services, the pro poor credit scheme of the VUP. Public work started in 2008 and direct support in 2009, while the microfinance scheme started in 2011. Next. <coughs> Next. So um, that was the VUP in its simple <coughs> formula at the, on, at the onset, that down the road, we had to conduct a gender equity study of the VUP at a time when we are seeing a sizable number of female beneficiaries and we thought we are going to have a very wonderful course. Uh, but surprisingly, we saw that the short-term nature of classic public works projects meant that many projects may provide inadequate income support, and this could be detrimental, could be worse when it comes to female-headed uh, households and uh, children. So VIP was declared to be gender blind, uh, meaning that by design, it was not cognizant of the differences in roles and responsibilities between men and women at home and even in the community. This was reduced <coughs> so, <coughs> by mothers working at public work sites with babies strapped to their backs, others pregnant, in both cases when men were not subjected to any burden uh, at all. Uh, it was characterized by self exclusion of mothers uh, who could not, who had commitment to do the household chores, especially uh, rendering care and responsibilities over children. Others, as a last resort, they would adopt some negative coping mechanism where you would find a girl child coming to take care of her sibling uh, at the work site, and this would stand in the way of education for the girl child, not the boy child, but the girl child, who was a better place to be a babysitter. Babies were also subjected to an hygienic situation, 
can imagine all the sweat, all the dust. Other young children would be left at home and attended or with nobody to prepare them for, prepare them for school or feed them after, uh, after school. Next. So in the design process for the expanded public works, uh, the gender equity study report was disseminated to government, development partners, and the local governments. This enhanced ownership for all, run design was a collective effort. Naming of this component was an issue. To many, we thought it was, should be flexible public works. Others said expanded public works, but expanded public works ruled and to maintain the flexi nature in terms of number of hours of work, number of uh, walking distance, when to work and they will, you know. Then uh, it had a lot of influence from the public works, which was labor-based and predominantly in the road sector. Uh, so for that matter on spot, we thought expanded public works would go into uh, flexible road maintenance, the labor-based nature, because uh, even at first we thought public works had to do uh, with the labor, and we are only seeing the benefit of being it light work, closer to the homes of the beneficiaries to cut the long walking distance, and uh, just to keep it simple. The problem was launch. Uh, you know, this was a strong innovation, and we were keen to see, are we investing these resources wisely? Uh, because of that dissemination that embodied everybody, UNICEF was there to make a small scale pilot, including mobile crashes for public work sites, which was not feasible at scale. So pilot assured the government and BPs that expanded public works work. Later, service-based public works, the home-based child care services was introduced into the scene in 2017. At the time, social protection was mandated to contribute to starting reduction. In 2019, nutrition sensitive direct support was also introduced to provide support against starting in young children uh, by providing monthly payment to pregnant women and the carers of children up to two years. Uh, World Bank recognized it and still does that Rwanda was among four countries who, with innovative social protection because of investing in areas through expanded public works and nutrition sensitive direct support. Uh, expanded public works and nutrition sensitive direct support are envisaged as proactive schemes in social protection and very practical in human capital development, now embedded in the national orientation agenda. Uh, they are visible in the national strategy for social for transformation and the social protection um, policies. So. Sorry. Sorry, Justin, just one, one and a half minutes left or so. I'm also cognizant that we're running out of time and I'd like to give the chance Thank to Rebecca much. also so, to talk. In the birth of uh, expanded public works and pollution, we see households, next slide, we see households with the labor capacity, they uh, go to class public works, then households with the limited labor and they having caring responsibilities, they go to expanded public works, but finally, uh, expanded public works are split into two, the labor-based one and the service-based one, where the labor-based one is in flexible road maintenance and where the service-based one is in the, uh, uh, in the child care centers, home-based, and all these beneficiaries still access the nutrition to direct support. Uh, with the, of course, other complementary services that are rendered by the VP, as you may see them there. Next slide, which should be the second last. Uh, under home-based child care, extremely poor eligible for expanded public works are trained as caregivers to care for preschool children from their community and reach out to their parents on positive parenting skills. Caregivers are trained to work with the standards set out uh, in the early childhood in the early child development guidelines. Services are provided in one of the caregivers' houses 
which may be renovated to provide a safe hygienic environment for children, how the children receive porridge on a daily basis to minimize the risk of malnutrition, and the expanded public works program also provides other necessary requirements like toys, sleeping mats, kitchen cutlery, and others. Then you have seven caregivers at each uh, home. Uh, they work in alternate interview intervals, two per day, but the lead caregiver has to be present uh, every day. Uh, last, last slide. Uh, this was just a snapshot of the gender safety net beneficiaries, where overall we have 52% of household members benefiting from safety nets being female. And the biggest diversity is direct support, where 60% of household members are female. 54% of household members being uh, uh, expanded public works, uh, female and classic public works, 50%. More children in safety net households are male, 55, but more people working age and older persons are female, 56 and 66% respectively. Thank you very much. The last slide was only showing a picture of children at the home based child care center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, that was really interesting and actually another really great um, example for um, how public works programs can be made more gender sensitive. And that is quite a nice transition to um, Rebecca actually, where I wanted to uh, asked to kick off the discussion um, and just tell us a little bit about your research, Rebecca. I know you've been doing a lot of work on gender sensitive social protection and how, how programs can be adapted. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you if you could share some practical lessons from your research um, about um, how these programs can actually address the various barriers that women face. Um, of course, we've heard some of it today, but um, I don't know, is there anything else that you think would be really worth adding? Thanks very much. And yeah, thank you to, to the other speakers as well for the great presentations. And um, I mean, it's really sort of complementary to some of the things which we've heard, especially from the, the Mozambique and, and Rwanda experiences. Um, you know, I think overall we've seen quite an increase in attention over the last few years to gender responsive social protection um, and increasingly seeing some nice sort of innovative, um, you know, program design and implementation features as well. I think one of the key areas that, you know, has been touched upon today is this need to get the balance right between the the care and domestic time sort of constraints and responsibilities that women and girls particularly face, as well as supporting the economic um, opportunities and economic needs of, of women as well and supporting their economic independence. And I think we've seen, you know, even from, from other public works programs as well, some nice translation of that into program design features such as the offering of direct support, especially for pregnant women or um, women who have just uh, given birth, as the example of Rwanda just showed, as well as providing you know, flexible working hours um, and offering work close to home, which has been really important in enabling women to sort of balance their care responsibilities. And so that's not a barrier to participation um, for women and also through program design to commit to equal wages between men and women. And this has been um, sort of a, a really important um, part of some program designs as well, that the public works the way that it's calculated doesn't discriminate against women if they can't um, or if they have to adapt their, their working arrangements, for example. Um, I think we've also seen some sort of innovations in the type of public works um, that has been conducted, you know, moving away from the um, sort of infrastructure focus, um, you know, as the example from both of the, 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 the countries today around the provision of childcare, offering different types of skills and opportunities, um, work which might 
um, support um, sort of female headed or, or labor constrained households. So that kind of community work to, to help households in the community as well. I think there's some really innovative and nice examples of, of supporting that balance between sort of childcare, domestic responsibilities and, and economic needs. Um, I think there's also some, you know, some other innovations, including from other types of social protection programs, which also sort of focusing more on breaking down some of those social norm barriers, some of those sort of discriminatory gender um, norms and sort of roles and responsibilities, which can promote a more transformative um, approach or more transformative outcomes for women and girls as well. You know, thinking about, for example, um, types of, of work opportunities or skills building opportunities that might break down those stereotypical barriers or stereotypical gender norms in terms of appropriate type of work for women, appropriate type of work for men, which obviously have really long term beneficial effects going into the future as well. Also thinking about how social protection programs can potentially support a redistribution of that gender division of labour at home through, for example, um, extra sessions or awareness raising sessions on co-parenting, on domestic responsibilities, which might not be through that core social protection programme itself, but might be through creating linkages to other programs and services which are available in the community, but thinking a bit more broadly about you know, changing the, that nature of um, restrictive gender, gender norms, which constrain you know, women's participation, but also women and young girls benefits from social protection programs. Um, I think it's also just Im important not only to think about that sort of technical core social protection design, but the importance of monitoring and evaluating social protection programs as well from a gender perspective. And it's important to consider not only trying to capture and monitor positive outcomes from social protection, but also potential negative impacts or outcomes. It might be unintended, but it's important, especially where programs are trying to shift gender relations, important to monitor where there might potentially be backlash, there might be tensions in the in intra-household, for example. But monitoring those is really important. So including that within the program design and not only disaggregating, um, you know, monitoring questions by gender, but really thinking about what types of questions need to be posed to capture those changes in gender relations that might be showing changes in women's economic empowerment, decision making in the house or young girls opportunities. So important to, to consider that as well. So I guess in, in summary, it's, you know, from, from the research that myself, but that others have been doing as well over the last few years, I think, you know, there are increasingly positive effects on outcomes for women and girls, also for men and boys as well. But I think, you know, having, paying attention to some particular design features, both within the programme, but also considering the, the environment, the operating environment that a social protection is working in, and how to measure those outcomes um, is also really important. And thinking about not only how programs can change or meet women's needs, but also thinking and looking for those opportunities within social protection programs to promote a more transformative approach as well. And I think going forward, there's going to be even more you know, great examples coming out of countries as well as, as we continue along different social protection mechanisms. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box right now. Um, we do have a few minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, please pop them in there or just um, let me know. Um, otherwise, in the meantime, maybe I'll just take that um, that bit from Rebecca forward um, and, and ask um, 
what what do we think is sort of the next um you know the next step what what could be the next opportunity as as rebecca um also mentioned of you know making things making these programs even more transformative um tony um uh, or Kalotta, I don't know. I know we've, we're starting to think about this in Mozambique, right? What could be some other sectors or models that that could be promoting this? Um, and I know we're sort of in the beginning, but I was wondering um, if you could share any ideas already. And equally, Justin, maybe you can just sort of say what you think is the next the next bit in in Rwanda uh, on this journey to to make uh, the public works program more transformative. Um, I don't know, Carlotta, would you like to start? Can I, can I start? Oh, you can start, Justin, of course. Okay. Yeah, it's all right, uh, I can start. I think as much as we should be proud that uh, countries are increasingly uh, researching into this and the designing gender sensitive social protection schemes. Uh, there is a lot more uh, to do. Uh, one, for the case of Rwanda, we know uh, we shouldn't look at uh, conception smoothening only. Our social protection program has two components. There is a safety net component and there is a livelihood enhancement component. Again, in the livelihood enhancement component here, this is where we should exploit the possibility of really uh, supporting uh, girls, supporting women to graduate out of poverty, not stop at smoothing consumption. Uh, so uh, skills development for girls and women could be very critical. Uh, here we are focusing on expanded public works, but I know in our microcredit scheme, there is a beautiful window for women and girls and for, for youth, where they are incentivized to partake in income uh, generating activities. So we should even have a wider scope. As Rebecca was talking about the monitoring and evaluation, uh, we should be keen to know uh, because where through female beneficiaries, where families have made a big difference with uh, a woman on the steering wheel. Uh, we've seen this in Rwanda. We've seen where at, on, at start, there are difficulties in making decisions around the spending of this money. But finally, we see uh, consensus building Finally, we see a uh, woman having a big uh, stake to hold, and we see yet bigger achievements. We are even seeing more achievements in the female-headed families. We are seeing achievements where through social protection, uh, the, 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 the female spouse has had a role in decision-making. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Um, Kalata, do you want to maybe come in here and, and speak a little bit about what's next for, for, for Mozambique and the PASH uh, on this journey? Sí, obrigada, mais uma vez. Uh, a semelhança de, do, do que Mante se deu, uh, nos países pobres como o nosso, uh, verifica-se muito grupo de jovens que ficam numa situação sem escolaridade ou não con conseguir concluir a escolaridade e, consequentemente, desemprego. E esse, os programas de proteção social, uh, a ideia é buscar esses jovens. E no caso vertente de Moçambique, uh, as atividades implementadas no âmbito dos trabalhos públicos, particularmente nas zonas urbanas, não têm sido muito atrativo para esse grupo de jovens de 18 aos 25 anos. Então, é preciso também que o governo olhe essa, esse grupo, porque eles é que vão dar continuidade no, 
do amanhã, e se nós queremos reduzir a questão da pobreza em Moçambique, particularmente, precisamos investir muito neste grupo de jovens. Razão pela qual o governo moçambicano abraçou esta iniciativa com UVA, exatamente para investir um pouco mais neste grupo de jovens. E, e o próximo passo é mesmo pegar essa iniciativa que começamos aqui na cidade de Maputo, no âmbito dos trabalhos públicos, nós consideramos ainda assim, e expandir a nível uh, nacional, principalmente numa primeira fase da, na, na, nas zonas urbanas. É onde nós temos uma estrutura e também é onde há maior concentração de grupos de jovens. Então, a ideia é nós expandirmos com o apoio do Banco Mundial, só que nós, para além de eh, potencializar, porque verificamos que uh, a questão de mentoria tem sido um, muito forte, é importante, não basta só dar, uh, criar essa oportunidade, uh, mas também é preciso uma mudança de comportamento. E achamos de que se nós trabalharmos um pouco mais na mudança da atitude desse grupo de jovens, uh, podemos ter, mesmo em termos de investimento, podem ser baixos, porque significa que esse jovem, depois de mudar de comportamento, eu, o governo pode investir muito pouco, mas ele já tem capacidade de andar por si. Então também é importante olharmos nessa, nesse aspecto. Uh... E continuarmos a trabalhar. É, é tudo o que eu tinha para dizer. Obrigada. Muito bom, obrigada. Um, Tony, I don't know if you also want to add something. I mean, I know we're sort of in the beginning of thinking about new, um, new models, um, but is there anything sort of, you know, that comes to mind already, any criteria or, or sort of like uh, pointers of, of what else could be um, a model that provides this triple win. Uh, th thank you, Anna. Well, no, it's still at an early stage, but um, um, we, we, yeah, we can talk about the criteria. Uh, we're looking for uh, opportunities um, uh, in the social sectors uh, for Uh, work that would be appealing to young people and in particular, uh, particularly young women um, um, in the social sectors um, that sort of like the mover assistance example could, uh, could do two things at once and can it improve service delivery in the social sector concerned and at the same time provide interesting skills development opportunities and you know, longer term opportunities for economic inclusion and empowerment for the young people concerned. And so, I mean, there are two sort of fundamental criteria, really. One, one is feasibility and the, and, the, and the other is relevance. I mean, with respect to relevance, um, we need to find opportunities that are, uh, you know, that, that provide a, a social benefit, you know, like the assistance in the, the assistance in the, in the classrooms clearly do. Um, we're looking at, you know, various uh, things like um, um, whether it would be possible for young people to be brought in, for example, into the community health worker system, just to give an, an example, or is there something that uh, young people could be doing um, to improve the, the monitoring and management of uh, WASH, water supply and sanitation, at uh, community level, for example. So it, it, its first criterion really in terms of uh, relevance is that it brings a, a clear social benefit. Um, and then the, the other side of it is that it, you know, that it, um, it does provide an opportunity for skills development and for learning for the, for the young people concerned. Then in, in terms of, uh, you know, the other side, which is feasibility, um, I mean, we, we need to make sure that we're identifying opportunities that are, that are really viable, you know, in technical, institutional and financial terms. And I think that means that, um, you know, the institutions in the different sectors concerned would need to really buy into these ideas, see these ideas as, as potential solutions to service delivery problems um, that they face. Um, and, and that there are, in, you know, in the long term, going beyond sort of short term uh, financing through public works program, there are opportunities here to uh, 
finance this kind of activity in in the longer term so that the initiative uh, can can be sustainable so uh, mover is going to be with with enash actually um with carlotta uh, we're mm -hmm. going to be you know looking at some of these um possible options um and trying to trying to develop some concrete uh, proposals in in the next few weeks perfect um Thank you so much. This is um, all very exciting. Um, I think we've reached the end of our first session. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Carlotta, Tony and Justin for joining us today. It's been a really interesting uh, discussion and we've seen a lot of great examples. Um, and uh, Rebecca unfortunately already had to go, but it was also very interesting to hear from her and very encouraging to hear that this is really something that is gaining more and more prominence on the global scale. Um, so yes, over to you, Magali, I think, to take us to the next session. Um, everybody's very warmly invited to, to stay on and hear more in detail about MOVA's particular experience of how we've moved from pilot to now a program that's being implemented together with the government of Mozambique and Inash. Thank you, Yana. And really, I'd like to echo what you said, thanking our panelists for your presentations and the insights that you've shared during this hour. It's been, it's been really interesting. And now, as Yana said, we will shift gears a little bit and zoom in on MUVA and specifically the Assistentes project, which Carlotta did uh, speak about earlier. Um, <clears throat> sorry, so we will take just a brief five minute break and come back at 10 minutes past the hour uh, and continue the discussion then. So if you would like to, to attend, please stay on the line and we will be right back in just five minutes. All right, well, welcome back everyone. Um, for the, the second part of today's event, I'd like to welcome back Yana. Uh, who will be joined by Carrie Sylvester, the m and &E lead for MUVA, as well as Lucia Bernadette, who has led MUVA's work on the Assistentius project. So they will present in greater detail about MUVA's innovative and very successful Assistentius project. And then we will have about 25 to 30 minutes for a question and answer session. So do feel free to either uh, type your question in the chat or uh, to raise your hand and we will um, unmute you so that you can speak when the time comes. So uh, with that, I will hand the mic over to Lucia um, so that she can begin. Lucia, over to you. What are they? Boa tarde. Então, eu vou fazer uma breve apresentação sobre o assistente. Os panelistas que me antecederam fizeram referência ao assistente, mas sem muitos pormenores. Então, a ideia é, nesta segunda parte, partilharmos com mais detalhes o que foi e o que está a ser esta iniciativa. Uh, esta iniciativa, portanto, é uma iniciativa MUVA, como devem saber, o MUVA trabalha para uh, identificar, testar e escalar abordagens de empoderamento econômico feminino. E então, estas testagens têm sido feitas através de várias iniciativas. E uma das iniciativas que foi identificada foi a iniciativa uh, que nós denominamos de Move Assistente. Então, a iniciativa Move Assistente A iniciativa MUVA Assistente uh, está a ser implementada diretamente pelo MUVA, mas uh, a partir de 2020 nós começamos este processo de uh, ver como é que esta iniciativa, pelo sucesso que, tinha, que tem estado a produzir, poderia ser escalada. E como nós, desde o princípio, identificamos como uma iniciativa de proteção social, Então, procuramos engajar o INAS para conosco uh, desenvolvermos esta iniciativa na perspectiva de que, de fato, o INAS pudesse depois escalar. 
Então, em que consiste esta, esta iniciativa? Esta iniciativa consiste em colocar jovens uh, que são identificados ao nível das comunidades, ao nível das comunidades à volta das escolas que serão abrangidas. Estes jovens são previamente treinados por uma instituição de formação de professores e, posteriormente, esses jovens são colocados na escola para, para desempenharem a função de assistentes de professor. Mas como é que esta iniciativa surge? Esta iniciativa surge na perspectiva de dois problemas que o MUBA identificou na primeira fase da, das suas intervenções. O MUBA, quando inicia a desenvolver as suas atividades, começou por fazer pesquisas para identificar, de fato, quais são as áreas, quais são as ações que poderiam, de fato, contribuir para esta questão de empoderamento econômico feminino. E, nessa altura, dois problemas foram identificados. Um deles, o fato de que, no nosso país, o rácio professor-aluno é muito grande. Um professor chega a ter, na sua sala de aulas, 80 a 100 alunos. E isto traduz-se na sobrecarga do trabalho do professor e também impacta um pouco naquilo que é a qualidade do ensino. Por outro lado, nós temos jovens que terminaram o nível médio, que não estão a fazer nada, mas sobre os quais as famílias fizeram um grande investimento. O Estado também fez um grande investimento porque colocou professores para terem a formação que eles têm, mas estes jovens não estão a produzir. E então o assistente foi como que uma solução que poderia, por um lado, apoiar os jovens, mas por outro lado, apoiar o professor que também se encontra superlotado. Então foi assim que a iniciativa Muva Assistente surge, olhando para o problema do professor, mas também olhando para o problema do jovem, como é que esses dois problemas se poderiam, uh, poderiam resultar numa solução. Então, do ponto de vista de o que, é que nós pretendemos com esta iniciativa, é, de fato, por um lado, a criar condições para que o jovem tenha a sua primeira experiência de trabalho a, e, ao ter a sua primeira experiência de trabalho, estar a se preparar para a, entrar no mercado de trabalho. Mas, por outro lado, de fato, apoiarmos a, na melhoria da qualidade de ensino através deste apoio ao professor na sala de aula. Ah, na sala de aulas, após a colocação do professor na sala de aula, no, do assistente na sala de aula, e a sua uh, permanência na sala de aula resulta de um processo que é construído juntamente com as entidades ao nível da educação, incluindo as entidades comunitárias, que são as que apoiam no processo da seleção desses jovens, que não são jovens quaisquer, portanto, são jovens Uh, que vivem naquelas comunidades ao redor das escolas selecionadas, uh, são jovens que vivem também em famílias carenciadas, que não estão a estudar e também não estão a trabalhar. Portanto, é mesmo um programa uh, de proteção social, no sentido de que apoia os jovens uh, a realizarem uma atividade, como se dizia nos painéis anteriores, uma atividade de interesse público, mas ao mesmo tempo, através de subsídios que são fornecidos, estes jovens podem usar estes subsídios para a melhoria ah, da sua qualidade de vida e para a preparação até, inclusive, do que eles irão fazer após a saída deste, desta iniciativa, que é guardar algum dinheiro para a aquisição de material escolar, se ele quer se inscrever numa escola para dar continuidade, ah, utilizar este dinheiro, inclusive, para resolver problemas básicos alimentares da sua própria família, então, nós olhamos, de fato, este, esta iniciativa como uma iniciativa de proteção social e é por isso que fizemos este encaixe com os programas de proteção social que estão implementados pelo INAS. O subsídio que estes jovens recebem, tivemos que fazer o alinhamento com o subsídio que o governo está a dar, para os programas de proteção social, é, medicagem, é, 1.050 medicagem, que vale mais ou menos a 17 dólares é, mês. Eles trabalham em média quatro horas por dia, obedecendo ao horário do professor do ensino primário. 
Portanto, é um professor, um assistente, uma turma. É assim que a abordagem funciona. Do ponto de vista de responsabilidades, o assistente na sala de aulas não substitui o professor. Ah, ele é uma figura, de fato, de apoio. Ele cria condições para que a sua turma ah, tenha, esteja em condições de higiene, do ponto de vista da limpeza da sala de aula, mas também do ponto de vista de disciplina dos alunos que é parte das atividades que consumiam bastante tempo ao professor. O professor entra na sala de aula, tem que verificar se a sala está limpa, tem que garantir que as crianças estão silenciosas. Então, esta parte de, de, de atividades passa a ser feita pelo assistente, o que liberta um pouco o professor destas tarefas que nós chamamos de tarefas complementares. E porque a turma é muito grande, este assistente apoia o professor a corrigir os trabalhos de casa, mas também a corrigir os exercícios que o professor dá dentro da sala de aula. Por outro lado, este assistente também apoia o professor a identificar aquelas crianças que têm mais dificuldades, são recorrentes de não compreender a matéria. E juntamente com o professor, eles é, identificam uma estratégia, definem uma estratégia de apoio a estas, a estas crianças com, com dificuldades. Em termos de o que é que realmente esta iniciativa está a trazer, do ponto de vista de impacto. Do ponto de vista de impacto, nós podemos ver que há mudanças bastante significativas dentro da sala de aula, no que diz respeito, como dizia há bocado, à própria disciplina dentro da sala de aula, no que diz respeito a que os cadernos dos alunos são corrigidos mais vezes ao longo da semana, o que não acontecia quando o professor Suzinho tinha os 80, os 80 crianças na sala de aula, é difícil corrigir 80 cadernos. Então, há mudanças do ponto de vista da escola, da sala de aulas, da qualidade de ensino, mas também há mudanças no que diz respeito aos jovens. Um dos objetivos era preparar o jovem para o mercado de trabalho, era trazer o jovem as capacidades de comunicação, de autoestima, de saber interagir com os outros, de fazer diálogos conscientes e construtivos. E então há impactos nos dois lados que o programa tem estado a, a produzir ao longo deste, deste período. Então, neste momento, nós implementamos desde 2017 a 2019 na cidade de Maputo. Como já nos referimos, juntamente com o INAS, chegamos a atingir 15 escolas, das quais cinco foram implementadas pelo INAS e 10 pelo MUVA. Neste período, nós eh, beneficiamos cerca de 500, uh, 500 jovens. Neste momento, nós uh, conseguimos alargar o programa a partir do ano passado até este ano para Nampula e Pemba, onde já estamos a assistir cerca de 13 escolas e 300 jovens estão a beneficiar desta iniciativa. Prevemos expandir no próximo ano para as cidades de Quilimane e da Beira. Do ponto de vista de perspectivas, para além desta expansão para o próximo ano, a ideia de fato é alargar o programa, como a Carlota já se referia, para que seja um programa nacional e acreditamos que, porque o INAS tem delegações em todo o país, se o INAS de fato abraçar esta iniciativa, nós vamos poder cobrir o país todo e este, esta iniciativa tem o um potencial de criar cerca de 21 mil postos de emprego temporários, é claro, se ele for expandido para todo o país. Ah, por outro lado, como também se referiu o panelista anterior, o Tony, nós eh, pretendemos identificar outras atividades que se encaixam neste modelo eh, assistente, onde jovens desenvolvem atividades de interesse público, usando esta abordagem que usamos agora no assistente, recebem uma transferência monetária e assim podem se preparar para a, a sua progressão futura. Uh, continuamos a questão de produção de evidências através da ANSA, nós temos estado a trabalhar muito nesta questão de monitoria e avaliação e também eh, queremos, eh, com a implementação pelo INAS, fazer com que eh, esta iniciativa for, seja integrada mesmo oficialmente dentro dos programas de proteção social. Portanto, isto é o que pretendemos que uh, aconteça nos próximos anos e o maior sucesso para esta iniciativa é de fato ver esta iniciativa 
integrada dentro das abordagens do governo como uma iniciativa de proteção social. Então, acreditamos que esta parceria com o INAS vai fazer com que realmente esta realidade seja, seja alcançada. Penso que é tudo por agora. Acredito que as minhas colegas depois vão apresentar com mais detalhes os resultados através dos resultados de monitoria e avaliação que serão em seguida também apresentados relativamente a essa iniciativa. Obrigada. Thank you, Lucia, um, for this presentation. So I'm just going to continue now with um, presenting some of the results from um, our monitoring, evaluation and learning um, work. Next slide, please. Um, if there are any questions in the meantime, please pop them in the chat, or I'm also very happy to just uh, for you to just stop me and I, am, I can answer them. So um, this is a, a sort of summarized theory of change. I don't think I'm going to explain it in that much detail because I think Carlotta and Lucia already did a great job in explaining um, how the program works and what its components are, um, combining the mentoring component with the paid work experience as teaching assistants and a pedagogical training. Um, on the side here, the only thing I wanted to point out is this um, influencing um, this influencing path that um, we very purposefully built into the theory of change. And Kerry is going to speak a little bit later about how um, we've actually, uh, you know, sort of um, developed a strategy uh, to not only pilot this program uh, and test it, but also then think about how it can be strategically scaled through the government of Mozambique. Um, but before that, I'm just going to talk a little bit more in detail about uh, the results from uh, the various rounds of implementation that we had. So the MEL approach that we took was a theory-based mixed methods approach um, in which we collected data or around intermediate outcome and outcome level indicators across two pathways. So the first one being outcomes on the participant level and the second one um, being outcomes on the classroom level. Um, I think both uh, Carlotta and Lucia already spoke a little bit about the results that uh, we could see in the first few rounds. Um, with relation to self-confidence and empowerment, soft skills, financial inclusion and independence, agency and decision-making power, and employment and education outcomes, um, as well as uh, at the changes on the classroom level. But um, I just wanted to use this opportunity to talk a little bit more about how we measured some of these um, factors and how we reached the results. So next slide, please. Um, so one, one bit that I want to highlight, because I think it's quite um, innovative uh, and interesting, actually, um, is around how um, we looked at these outcomes around self-confidence and empowerment. And this, this was done in the first, uh, uh, at the very first pilot round um, of, of the Assistentes project that we did in Maputo City. Um, so we adapted the photo voice methodology, which is a qualitative measurement technique um, that is particularly used for difficult to measure concepts such as self-confidence and empowerment, um, to look at how the project has changed these, um, these outcomes within the girls that went through the project. Um, we randomly selected 19 out of the 72 classroom assistants that were part of the first pilot round. Um, and the way that the photo voice methodology works is that uh, the participants are being given cameras um, and they are asked to take photos um, around a specific um, framing questions. We had three framing questions, um, which were asked both at baseline, midline and endline. And those three questions were, where are you now? Where do you see yourself in the next three years? And how does the classroom assistant experience contribute to your ability to reach your objective? So based on those three questions, um, the participants were given cameras and they were asked to take photos that for them represents an answer to those questions. Um, and then once, they, once they've taken those photos, they um, participated in an interview with trained qualitative researchers 
um, whom they explained their photo to and, and what can be seen in the photo and, and why they've taken this photo to answer the question. So next slide, please. Um, so I want to take a little bit of time to just show some of the quotes and the photos that um, came out of this because I think it's really quite um, it's quite interesting and, and powerful and maybe um, complements some of the things that Carlotta and, and Lucia have said before. So what we've seen at baseline um, is that a lot of girls um, that participated in the program uh, spoke about their situation in the sense of um, a situation in which they are mostly confined to the house, not really um, involved in many activities, neither in education nor in employment. And various um, participants actually used sort of plants to, to symbolize this, this feeling about where they are now at, at, at the baseline. So um, this picture here of this small plant is one of the pictures that was taken at baseline and the um, quote around this um, that described it said, um, this picture represents where I am today because the plant has burned leaves and it shouldn't be that way. I'm in a situation where I don't study, I don't do anything. The leaves illustrate the time I spend at home. I took the picture because I always look at the trees and ask myself whether they change or stay the same because they always look the same. Like me, they find themselves in the same situation despite even though time passes. So this is quite representative of many of the photos and quotes that we got at baseline. Um, and at midline, this started to change and uh, a lot of the respondents um, showed pictures of themselves as, as assistants in the classroom and uh, described how, how this, this, this experience um, sort of brought about a very strong change in their lives um, and also in the way that they feel and see themselves. And then finally at end line, um, some, some respondents picked up this theme of the plants again, uh, showing uh, that there has been quite a change in the, way, um, uh, in the way that they see themselves and where they see themselves as growing and, um, and uh, on the path to complete their, their plans. Um, uh, and uh, especially some of the mentoring sessions were mentioned here. So for example, in this end line quote, um, what, what uh, the person said was that the biggest change I see is my way of thinking and seeing things after all, everything comes down to the way we think. My first photo from last year was a tribe land, plant without any life, but the second photo where I see myself in three years was full of life. Through the mentoring sessions, I came to understand that I don't need these three years, even though I haven't completed all my plans, I am no longer a dry plant. Um, so this is quite a nice quote, I think, which sort of like shows this journey uh, to empowerment and confidence that many of the participants experienced through the program. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I don't want to take too much time, I think, because I also want to make sure that we have time for questions in Carrie's presentation. But just to say that we also measured soft skills for employment, especially communication skills. And we saw that for all of the cycles, um, there was um, uh, quite a significant increase uh, in observed communication skills for, um, on average, for the participa uh, participating assistants. Next slide, please. We've also um, looked at some financial inclusion and independent indicators, um, and we've seen quite some changes there between baseline and endline as well. Um, we had a huge increase of participants that had bank accounts, but this is also due to the fact that um, in order to receive their payments, um, the program facilitated them in opening bank accounts. Um, but we even saw increases in the percentage of people that uh, had mobile money accounts and also in those that participated in rotating saving groups, um, sort of bringing home this point that, that the program does um, support uh, financial inclusion of its participants. Next slide, please. Um, we also, six months after the end of the program, compared um, those participants that went through the Assistentis um, project to um, a comparable um, group of uh, young women that um, we drew from a representative household survey that MUBA conducted um, in the cities of Maputo and Beira in 2000 and 
2017, which was around the same time that the first pilot of the Assistentes project um, took place. Um, and uh, based on a propensity score matching technique um, on the basis of various factors such as um, gender, level of schooling, geographical area of residence, household poverty score, and number of children and age, um, we matched the participants to non-participants um, and across various of the agency indicators, which are expressed through decision-making um, power indicators, we can see that at the end of the project, assistantes, um, participants from the assistantes project report much higher decision-making um, autonomy than a, a comparable group of, of girls that didn't do the project. Um, so just maybe to highlight how, how this is meant to be interpreted, for example, the purple bar shows the percentage of assistentes that, for example, say that they decide about their economic activities alone. Um, so this means about what they work, where they work, how much, um, how much time they spend working and so on. Um, so 95% of participants say that they take these decisions autonomously, while only 69% of the comparable group of girls that didn't do the project say the same. And we also looked at these indicators um, around um, education decisions, decisions about movement and mobility, um, the way in which they're involved in decisions on small and large household expenditure. Next slide, please. Um, we did a similar matching exercise also for uh, indicators around employment and education outcomes six months after the end of the Assistentes project. Um, what we can see is that there's um, a significant difference between the percentage of uh, Assistentes participants that were doing some sort of remunerated economic activity um, six months after the project compared to a similar group of young women that did not participate in the project. Um, and we can also see that of those that do um, do remunerated uh, economic activities, um, a larger proportion of the assistentes actually perform occupations that are of non-elementary nature. So that means that have some sort of higher skills requirement compared to elementary occupations such as um, uh, sort of manual uh, jobs uh, such as cleaning or selling um, small products on the, on the street or so on that don't have, have much of a, a skills requirement. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so both Lucia and Carlotta actually already mentioned some uh, results around things that have changed in the classroom as a result of this, um, of this intervention. Uh, and I actually don't want to repeat the results necessarily, but I maybe just want to add how these kind of results have come about. Um, so again, we took a sort of mixed methods approach uh, in order to measure some of these indicators related to an improvement in the classroom. Um, and uh, the qualitative side of this mixed message approach looked at um, interviews with teachers, so asking teachers themselves of, uh, around what has changed uh, in the way that the classroom is managed as a result of the introduction of the um, classroom assistants. And then we also did some quantitative classroom observations, um, uh, observing both uh, classrooms um, at baseline and endline where an assistant was introduced and observing uh, classrooms at baseline and endline where assistants were not introduced. Um, we did this for the second phase where we looked at baseline and endline, but not the first phase where we only looked at the endline. Um, and can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Um, and some of the findings um, showed uh, improvements around classroom organization and management, the classroom atmosphere, and also the time that teachers had for direct involvement in teaching activities, such as um, being able to identify problems of learners and directing their attention to them. 
Um, so I'm going to wrap up. There's a lot of results. There's a lot of reports. Um, so if anybody is interested in, in reading up on those in more detail, um, we're very happy to share them. But I want to give some space now to Carrie to also tell us a little bit more about how we actually move from assistentes as a pilot to it becoming a government program. Okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Jana. And I think very grandly you said we had a strategy. I think we, um, yeah, we uh, worked with it. As anybody knows who's worked from um, piloting or practice into policy, uh, knows that it's a sinuous, uh, a sinuous road. So, okay, so I think that um, what was important at the very beginning of this is that both opportunity and pre preparation were really important. So the opportunity that we had was the social protection strategy. Um, in Mozambique, um, which gave the opening, the PASS program had the opening and as Carlotta presented earlier, uh, the space for us to think about this and there was, so there was an opportunity. And also the mover was also, I said, steeped in uh, social protection knowledge. Uh, there were three, at least three or four of the senior staff who'd worked for many years on social protection and had worked very closely also with the, um, the government, um, uh, with uh, the government body that uh, manages it, um, struggling with all, all of the issues around um, very poor countries trying to provide social basic security. Um, so we had um, these and then we had the possibility to identify this. So I think preparation was very important and the opportunity uh, to do something in that space was also important. And next slide, please. Um, so uh, also, I think that was what was really interesting um, in this um, process that we went through is that there's a you know a very deep recognition within the government service that it's actually quite difficult to take. I was quite interested with our our colleague uh, Justin that um, they had actually taken on quite a lot of risk when they started a number of their projects. But there's a quite a, a, a high level of um, non risk taking behaviour for very good reasons within the public sector, um, and also particularly to embrace the potential to fail. I think it's a very hard thing for for public sectors. To, to be able to do. But MOVER was actually mandated with this to, to look at new approaches um, for um, female economic empowerment. And we were able to take on the risk in terms of piloting um, this intervention um, together with, I mean, in that was, was all the way with us, but we were able to take the risk as a, as an, a non government part of the non government sector to see how it was working to, to adapt and then to work with it. So and what, what we had to make sure is that um, we didn't have such a boutique intervention that when we then said to the public sector, well, now it's yours, you know, <laughs> that they actually weren't able to do it. So tailoring it to, to mimic the conditions that would be possible for the public sector to, to uh, take on and replicate was also extremely important. Yes, next slide. So, um, so what do I say about, okay, so, when uh, our experience was that um, when you're doing this, you have to really knock on lots of doors. So it's not enough just to be knocking on the door of the public sector. You have to also be working with the other people who are involved in this whole issue around social protection. Um, so I've sort of <laughs> divided it into three groups here. So clearly working with like minded people is very important because this gives you support. It helps you to carry on. It gives you an input. Us, but sometimes it can, can become a bit of an echo chamber. So we're just talking to each other and saying, yes, 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 it would be really good to do this. Um, and that's maybe um, something that doesn't keep you on your toes. So it was also very important for us to um, engage with what I've put here as opponents. <laughs> so people who were maybe not on board, who were more interested in, we've got a lot of problems in Mozambique, we need to get this public, the classic public works off the ground. Why are we discussing this? What's all this about? about. Uh, we're still struggling with lots of other things. So, but listening to the ideas of, of your, of people who are not necessarily interested, they're, they're active in the field, but they're not necessarily interesting, are really important. They helped us to reflect, to adapt, to rethink what we were doing, to question ourselves. Um, and I think that was a really important um, lesson that we learned um, in this process of um, moving forward into a policy that could be, that could work. And then I said about the 
indifference, I, I don't think that's actually a word in English, but um, <laughs> it now is, um, that the most difficult group, because you know, the, and it will be the majority of people. You're not actually in their space. You're not actually doing what they want. Um, you're sort of on the edge of maybe something that somebody wants you to do, but, and, but they're very important. The people who are indifferent are very important because they're often the majority. So what did we try to do is, okay, so we tried to kick them in their weak spot. So what are their KPIs? What do they need to get done? Uh, what are their key performance indicators? Um, do they need to reach more of the beneficiary targets? Do they need to be more gender sensitive? So how can we repackage our arguments in order to help them to meet their KPIs and shake off this cloak of indifference? Um, and also another thing that we, is very important was inviting people to people-centered events. I've called them people-centered events to actually meet people and talk to them. I, I know that this has been very powerful. Um, it's not a sort of show and tell. It's not taking, oh, look at this poor girl who's now much better. But, but taking them to, to young women who have, who have found themselves, who have got themselves a job, who are doing something, it can be very powerful and much more than us showing graphs. And although we do believe in graphs, we do believe in our data and our evidence um inviting people to celebratory events and to discussions can be very also very important and also persistence i mean i must admit that probably some people who don't ever want to see our faces again <laughs> because we're always there we pop up we talk about it uh, we're convinced we have a very deep commitment to to the work that we do and um so this is something that's very, very important. I did a little PS here saying that um, if indifference is the main problem, if you can do your work close to pe where people are, um, <laughs> then you often manage to get some site visits and you might get some purchase. Okay, next, next one. Okay. Um, so then I say, okay, so you've knocked on the door, it's opened up and uh, you're through, you're through the door. Um, if you're through the door, um, then everybody who's worked in any policy environment, I mean, ours is uh, a very um, mixed <laughs> and, it's, and it is musical chairs. Um, so, you know, donors change, governments change, people change. Um, you have to keep the argument relevant to all of those people all the time, and it can be quite exhausting. So um, I found this quote about primary colours, um, that there are no, more than five primary colours, but in combination they produce more hues than can ever be seen. And I think we try to do that so what we try to look at is uh, to understand again i've said <laughs> what hue is most appealing so is it that it's gender now is it that it's use is it the demographic dev dividend is it urban unrest is it what is it that's um that's tweaking people's um, um interest and and to 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 change our hues in order to to catch attention the other thing is is that um yeah i mean we've had lucia on uh, myself uh, carlotta's been speaking and um, we're a team maybe of three or four five six people and each of us has our own particular passion around this um this uh, this subject um and so we send whoever is most passionate to the people who are who whose kpi they might talk to so this was also very much and then um as everybody knows it's been a very difficult uh, working environment in the last few um, years because of covid but also in mozambique we were hit by two massive cyclones you know in place in when that happens then you know social protection needs to turn itself to uh, attention to emergencies so a tactical retreat is um, keeping the music going but a tactical retreat is sometimes the best way you can do it let's go to the next one and then the last um, slide is 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 what i say that um I think it's very important for you to, uh, I don't know that I believe, I don't know if I can say everybody believes this, but that victory is a small, a series of small wins and it's not beating your opponent down. It's actually getting everybody to believe that it's, uh, you know, that, that, that there's a win-win in all of this. Um, and so uh, this is just a little series of how I felt that we had some of these small wins that actually made it, um, uh, made it to the, to the, oh, I've lost my slide. Uh, sorry, Can, I don't have it in front of me. Can you give it me back? Okay. Anyway, so there a series of small wins. Could you give me that slide back? Yeah. A series of small wins. So one is that the um, national um, 
that the National Institute began to participate, as Carlotta spoke about, and crucially that they provided the money. And this was really important because that's the government putting the money into something that was being piloted um, in, together with a civil society organization. Um, it's then written up into plans. Um, and for me, a, a very moving time was when people begin to speak about assistance, not as something done by MUFA, but as something that's done by the um, within the national plan. And then, as uh, Carlotta also said, that there's now a budgetary commitment to implement this approach. So with that, I'll stop. Um, these were just some of the insights we had into um, how we influenced and how we worked to get this over the line. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, um, as well as Jana and Lucia for your very, very interesting presentations. We have a couple of minutes left now for questions from the audience. If there's anything anyone would like to ask, please feel free to either type it in the chat or to raise your hand and we can unmute you and have you jump in. All right, um, maybe while we wait for uh, people to, to type their question or to jump in. Um, I had a question for you, Yana. I thought the, the results that you showed were really interesting, including in terms of uh, decision-making autonomy. And as we know, that's something which um, MUVA's process of agency building and empowerment contributed very significantly to, but you know, there's always um, social norms at play a little bit here um, as well. And so I wondered if this was something which MUVA had, um, had worked on in this project specifically, whether you had worked with, um, you know, families, parents, spouses um, as part of this initiative. I will actually put this question back to Lucia, um, I think, who um, knows the program the best. Um, I mean, I think there's probably something to be said here around the mentoring component and the importance that it plays in, in uh, uh, sort of explaining some of these outcomes. Um, but maybe Lucia, I'll let you come in here uh, and talk a little bit about this question that Magali had. Obrigada. Uh, não sei se entendi bem, mas a questão é a todo esta, este trabalho que nós fizemos para empoderar as raparigas, mas, por outro lado, a questão de normas sociais. Portanto, uh, foi consciente dessa, dessa realidade que nós, ao desenharmos a iniciativa, desenhamos no sentido de que os jovens iriam, sim, desenvolver esta atividade de interesse público, de apoiar os professores, mas nós introduzimos uma componente de mentoria. A Carlota fez muita referência da necessidade de juntar assistência às aulas com a componente de mentoria. Na componente de mentoria, nós tratamos desses aspectos. Falamos da questão da problemática das normas sociais, dos elementos das normas sociais que impedem este empoderamento da rapariga, que impedem que a rapariga possa uh, correr atrás dos seus sonhos em busca de novas oportunidades. Então, esta é uma das temáticas que tem sido abordada bastante nas sessões de mentoria. E as primeiras sessões é mesmo para compreender a realidade à sua volta e saber lidar com essa realidade. Portanto, saber que eu sou sim uma mulher, eu tenho responsabilidades em casa e na família, mas eu também posso ser uma provedora dessa mesma família. Portanto, ao mesmo tempo que assumo as minhas responsabilidades eh, domésticas, eu também tenho espaço para poder assumir outras responsabilidades que sejam públicas, como é sair do, do, do espaço privado, que é a casa, que é a família, e ir ao trabalho eh, e obter rendimentos que também vai beneficiar a própria família. Então, tivemos sim em consideração e a componente de mentoria trabalha exatamente para quebrar essas questões de normas sociais e outros elementos que são nocivos e que impedem a progressão, sobretudo da jovem rapariga. Não sei se respondi. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you, Lucia. Um, very, very interesting to hear a bit more about, about the, the project and the mentoring component. Um, do we have any other questions from anyone in the audience with us today? Um, if not, maybe I will, I will ask just a, a final question and then I'll wrap things up. Um, it was really interesting to see uh, about this um, approach that you had to uh, influence and, and to contribute to scale. And I wondered, Carrie, um, you know, whether there was anything that you had learned from the process over um, the past few years of kind of um, raising the profile of the assistantes model and, and of trying to uh, you know, move it from a pilot to something which is integrated into the Mozambique education strategy. Is there anything that you've learned that would change how you approached influencing um, public works programs in Mozambique moving forward? Yeah, as I said, I think that it's such an iterative process. Um, I th think that, um, I don't know if I would change anything because we needed just to act on the situation and the situation, the context always changes. Um, I think the only thing maybe I would emphasize is that we were all very, um, we were very passionate about trying to get this uh, this this um, initiative to be able to be re replicated at scale. And so the commitment that we had was was very strong. And so I think you do need a certain level of the heartbeat going through the whole thing. Um, but I think you also, we became uh, much wiser during the whole process. As I said, understanding other people's levers, understanding other people's uh, needs and really deep diving into um, the needs of the government, the needs of the donors, um, the different ways in which people are looking at the same problem as yourself and trying to be as open as you can um, to listen to that um, and not be you know so sort of deaf that you're not listening really to what people are telling you i think that was the big lesson that we learned at the very beginning um, and i mean then you hope that other people can listen to you too um, so i think that this sort of active listening that we tried to practice in mover is really important um, uh, because you're only a small part of someone's rather big job and i and i think that when we go forward as we as spoke about when tony was um talking about looking at these new initiatives these new spaces that we can move into to create this public good and also to provide maximum a decent work experience for young people i think this is also a skill that we're going to have to have we need to listen to these um other social services very closely to see what it is that they want to see if in fact we can you can provide it through this sort of intervention and if you can't also to be honest i mean i think at the bottom of it all um uh, we need to be clear and not you know sell something that's not not going to work so so i would just say that i think that it's about listening to what um other people need and recognizing that you can if you can help them to solve one of their problems you're probably going to get some purchase on your argument Great. Thank you, Carrie. Oh, I see Lourdes has raised her hand. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, thank you, Lourdes. Oh. Era só para congratular a, a equipa por este excelente trabalho feito com muito amor, muita dedicação e também uh, estou bastante feliz de saber que o INAS e o Ministério da Educação vão uh, adotar esta experiência para as outras províncias. Yeah. E penso que valeu a pena todo este esforço. It was really a great, uh, great work and uh, thanks for all these efforts, for all the, this uh, you for great the... team. <laughs> ok, bye bye. <laughs> uh, thank you for your kind words. I think that's <laughs> actually a really lovely note to to end on. So, so with that, I will say just a, a few words to, to close. Um, 
Thank you, Lucia, Yana, and Carrie for your presentation. I think you've really shown the, the transformative power of the assistantes model today. Um, so yeah, we've, we've reached the end of the MUVA webinar series. It's been really a real pleasure hosting all of you as we shared the lessons and the experiences coming out of the MUVA program over the past seven years and engaging with such a brilliant series of speakers. I would like to thank Sandra Tamil for her interpretation over the past month and a half of webinars that we've had as well as Klaus, Jeanette, and the rest of the Forever consulting team who've provided really invaluable technical support to the webinar series. And finally, I'd like to thank our speakers and, and facilitators, as well as the FCDO for their support to the MOVA program over the years. I hope everyone has enjoyed the, the discussions and that this series has given you plenty of food for thought. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.